Welcome back across space and time into the dark depths of the Captain's Quadrant, where we shine across all around the globe, from Australia to America, and this time we have a very special guest all the way from Canada, Star Trek Discovery's Michael Chen. Hey, Hello. how are you? Good, good. Welcome to the Captain's Quadrant. Thank you so much for taking the time out to hang with us a little bit and talk all I'm wonderful sure things that you're doing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Jace, uh, you're going to start it off today? Yes, we'll Michael. Um, again, thanks for, for coming on. I was yeah. introduced to you by Joe. Joe basically gave me the heads up because um, I'm a little bit behind in Discovery. So I'm a little bit, which is naughty, big sin for this show, but I'm a little bit behind. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, no worries. <laughs> so he, uh, he basically uh, had me onto your TikTok. And I've got to say, it was this beautiful, poignant TikTok about your journey into being able to get on and appearing on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that came out of that, and honestly, I obviously want to get you to talk about your journey there, but it was, to me, two things I got out of it. One of it was the power of resilience um, and, and, and self-belief. Can you maybe just, I know you're repeating yourself, but maybe just give the audience a bit of an idea of your journey from starting to act to getting to the point where you are on, discovery oh man you want, you want the whole Big thing question um, yeah. <laughs> take it off yeah. you know what let's, uh, let's start it back a little bit maybe let's just yeah. ask this question first then all right before we get there can you remember the moment you fell in love with star trek i don't know a moment uh in my life that i didn't know or love star trek um my mom uh, so my parents are from hong kong and uh they came here in 19 uh, to canada in 1972 and uh, my mother was a huge fan of Star Trek, uh, the original series. Uh, she loved uh, Captain Kirk. You know, William Shatner uh, was very attractive to her, <laughs> right? Like she had a crush on him and everything. So, you know, after I was born, my mom just kind of watched it with me. And, and, and once I started to, I guess, understand the world and, and, and understand what I was seeing. Like my mom introduced me to two things, basically. It was uh, Star Trek and Doctor Who. Oh. So both of which oh. I still love to this to this very Same. day. Same. Nice. So it's not like a moment. It's just Star Trek has been part of my life since as far as I can mm. remember. I remember most, you know, from like my furthest memories are basically Spock and Sulu. Sulu because Sulu looked like us. And Spock, because I thought Spock was also one of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds weird that I thought Leonard Nimoy was was Chinese. And you know what? Kirk actually says he he's tried, you know, when they went back in the past, so he's Chinese and had a, a rice machine accident. So ha. <laughs> <laughs> that's very good. Yeah, yeah just fine. But no, I, I loved both of those characters. As I got older, obviously uh TNG came along. And that is basically my track, right? Because yeah. like by that point, I understood things, and also I was watching it as it was being aired. You know, I, I it's not necessarily in order mm. the way I watched it. You know, because sometimes I miss it or whatever. But I loved, I loved TNG. You know, Jordy LaForge was my favorite character. Didn't really have any, you know, uh, lead Asians in that, but it's okay. That's where I was with uh, with Trek as a kid. Yeah, I I would say for, and I think Joe's the same too. I think TNG as a, as a kid, I was I think what twelve or thirteen when TNG hit. So what a sweet spot, you know, yeah. to, to get into Trek. So what about Deep Space Nine and Voyager like that? I was. TNG, you would have been at a ripe age to be loving that. I love, I loved every track, and that includes mm. Enterprise. <laughs> a lot of people hated it when it came out. I was like, no, man, and this whole pop song thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. All I can say is, thank God for streaming services nowadays. We can just skip the intro. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there, you've obviously the development of, you know, you've got this love of science fiction and all that kind of thing. Um. For me, as a kid, when I was watching Trek, it was a dirty little secret. I couldn't talk about it in the schoolyard. Did you have a group of people, friends, and that that were into the same thing when you were growing up? No, <laughs> no, I, I was, I was a, a bit of an outcast. I didn't really have friends. No, <laughs> no, no you, you're was, not alone. I was a kid that got a beautiful. 
Yeah. It's a it's a long story about racism and classism. Uh, and but I will kind of I will say this. Yeah. Star Trek gave me a lot of hope as a kid going through what I went through because of the diversity that we saw because how humanity had solved its money problems, solved its 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 racism problems. You know, it was a better future for us so that better humanity we go and explore the stars. In that way I think Trek was very important to me growing up. And and it's why I have always been in the track because of of that aspect, the hope that it gave me. I was uh, bullied a lot as a kid as well, and Star Trek for me was a safety net. It was that safe space for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd come home after having a shocking day at school, being a little fat kid. At the end of the day, Star Trek was something where the judgment wasn't there. It was about logic. It was about common sense. It was about working together as a group of people to solve a, a problem for a common, you know, cause. There's a power behind that. And and I think one of the things I find people who have grown up watching Trek, it really does help, obviously, with your family around you, but it does help you solidify your morals and your view on, on the world very much, I believe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is the journey of, because I was reading his bio, I read your bio on IMDb, and you know, yeah. wow, this is a journey. Man. Yeah. This is a guy who has been through very different pathways to get to the point for where he is. You were at one point planning to become a doctor. Right. I was. So uh, growing up, I was never an actor when I was a kid. I I had no desire to go to, to, to be in drama, to be in theater, none of that. I was drawn more to music. Unlike most Asians who were forced into playing piano, I, I begged my parents to let me learn, but I did start very late and didn't get very far. So I started at uh, age 13 to play the piano and I kind of stopped after I went to university because I didn't have time. I always wanted to be a doctor when I was young because I had a intense love, and I still do, um, intense love of science. My mom had a heart condition and seeing what uh, cardiologists did for her and helped her convinced me that that was my calling that I would also become a cardiologist. Imagine my own surprise, let alone my parents, but my own, when I was in university and got bitten by the acting bug, because that is not, it would have never crossed my mind. You, it says here that you actually did a couple of the, how you started was doing a couple of voiceovers. That's correct. correct. I, when I was in university, I, I was like, on several anime message boards. And I loved doing little, like, I guess you can call them audio parodies where I like would make trailers for like different things. And I would make fun of the characters and I would uh, imitate all the different voices from the animes that I watched. Some of my friends was like, hey, Michael, you, you do these really stupid voices. So why don't you take your stupid voices and put them in our, our <laughs> game project so that we have a game that you know, we can submit and to be marked. I'm like, sure, why not? So I I did some of that for them. And I was like, wow, this is, this is a lot of fun. I expanded on that on my own time um, with just basically pumping out more and more audio content of my own, uh, annoying the holy heck out of my, my neighbors and residents, of course, because... <laughs> I would be screaming into a microphone, you know. I would play every single character in my my little audio creations. Uh, I started just looking into, like, what it would take to be a voice actor. So that's actually how it started. It's like, okay, so I, I clearly like this. So maybe voice acting could be a side gig. I don't know. But the more I dug into it, the more I played around with it, the more it just took hold of me. Like nothing, like nothing in my life ever did. Like the passion just, just, I don't know, it just filled up my soul. I talked to my parents who were shocked, but also half supportive. They're like, well, you need to finish your degree, at least your, your, your bachelor of science. I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, duh, mm. you have to be practical about things. And then my dad's like, also, because mm-hmm. I'm a real estate agent, you need to get your uh, realtor license. I'm like, okay you know just in case you need work i'm like that's that's fine and also you have to take your mcat and your lsat and your uh, you know what just still wow. be a doctor for us real quick <laughs> <laughs> i did all that oh I wow my LSAT and I actually had a few offers to go to uh, law school in the states i took my mcat did quite well on that and i took my sat <laughs> which i did wow do so. wow um i did everything 
I did everything. And so my parents like, okay, wow. Uh, um, you are practical minded. Let's support you. You know, just, just, just so you can get it out of your system. So I went to film. You didn't school. really leave them a, a lot of choice, did you? In the end, no, you said, all right, I'll do it. it. Have you cleaned your room? Have you taken? <laughs> yeah, right. Have you take the draft? You've done everything else. I mean, I technically I started late, right? Like I signed, I, I applied for film school in two thousand and five, so I was twenty four. A lot of people start younger than that, but yeah. it doesn't matter. I went to film school, which was good and bad. I won't get into that. But uh, <laughs> fast forward, I've been an actor for 17 years. Uh, you, you talked about film school, though. And you said talked about being a voiceover. That's a jump, though, to go from voice to actually being on stage in front of people. The Was reason the desire, why I did that. Did that, that ever kind of cross my mind? How am I going to, do I feel that confidence to get in front of hundreds of people? Before? I felt that to be a voice actor, I'm, I would need to understand the industry. And the film school I went to promised a more well-rounded education to give you an idea of what everything is like. So that's what drew me to it, because I just wanted to understand what I'm getting myself into. So then after film school, my plan was to then specialize, right? To then get more specialized training in voiceover work, which, which I did do. As I was making my way through film school, I uh, discovered that I was also quite adept at being on camera. And loved also writing little skits. So, which were, I mean, I guess in a way came out of my whole writing little audio parody things too, right? So by the time I got out of film school, I was trying to do everything. But my main source of work at the beginning that I got paid for was voiceover work. I did a lot of commercials. I did uh, reading of sponsor names for street festivals, stuff like that. That's where I started. Cutting your teeth. Yeah. I mean, outside of that, I did a lot of free work, like a lot. Student films, free independent films. Uh, I I was on stage a lot. I did get paid to be in, in a Shakespearean play. Nope. Uh, the name of which, if I say out loud, is bad luck, so I won't. Oh. But the Scottish play. Right now, is, there'll is be an image coming play. up of what it was. Uh, <laughs> the Scottish play. It's on my resume. But yeah. <laughs> now you can find it, Michael Chan. Yeah, like I did theater. I, I did. I even did free theater. Like I was the lead in a production put on by the Chinese Business Association to to celebrate the Dragon Boat Festival. Mm. I, uh, you know, I was a pirate at the Pirate Festival. I was mm -hmm. a knight at the Ren Festival. Uh, Ren Fair, I mean. And I've done I that. Did, <laughs> yeah, oh, so much fun. Yeah, based, and then I also did background work. I did a lot of background work for years, which was also paid. That allowed me to get onto larger sets, professional sets, union sets eventually, that gave me an education in how things were truly made and definitely much more of an education and allowed me to meet a lot of people and, and, and just, I guess, get myself out there. And so, yeah, I, I worked my way up, built relatively large non-union resume before I, I got my agent, my first agent, technically my second, my first <laughs> agent, second agent, I considered my first real professional agent and that got me into the union. And from there, I just, uh, I spent nine years with that agent before I, I uh, switched to the agent I'm with now, who basically changed everything for my career because they understood how to how to market me as i mentioned in my tiktok if you want to talk about star trek obviously star trek wasn't filming here in toronto when i began in the years prior to discovery uh coming to toronto my goals were very small just get work get work and yeah. get work train get work train get work train get work and i have no never had big goals for my agents but once star trek showed up that's when i said to my agent my previous agent this is it i've always just said i want a book i want a book in tv film commercials those and and if possible voice acting because once i joined the union voice my voice acting career just disappeared because competition is mm. high and the community is small to break into wow i didn't know that that's interesting yeah. yeah you um, figured that voiceover would be easier for you it is easier for me but yeah uh how I got into the union was not voice work. And so, and how I built my resume was not voice work. 
mm-hmm. which is how I ended up being a film actor predominantly. So, but yeah, like I told my agent, this is what I want. Let's put a plan together. And my previous agent kind of wasn't interested, but I, I was, and I started outside of searching for a new agent. I started to work on things that would, uh, that would help potentially get me Star Trek. Eventually I got my my new agent. I I used to be 235 pounds. Yeah. I dropped my weight to at that point 155 pounds. We're going to have to talk about how I can get to that. <laughs> <laughs> I there there is good body diversity in Star Trek, but I was told by many 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 people that how, you would have a higher chance of getting into Star Trek if you if I would if I was more fit, I worked on that. I mean, I had health reasons and I was, we were trying to have a, uh, our first child. So I wanted to be a better dad too. So there was like multiple reasons to lose the weight, right. but Star Trek was one of them. So I lost the weight. I got a new agent who then focused me on a track that would allow me to get into Star Trek. For example, building a resume that would have roles that more closely resembled what someone who's in star trek would be doing right you know okay. like cop roles to, you know stuff like that right more technical more role. uniform look yeah, yeah. That makes sense uh, yeah. i had a, i had a demo reel made that had roles like that as well uh is that I the demo reel that's on imdb the reel that is on imdb is my current reel i had a, i have an older one because my current reel has more now that i'm in trek now i'm refocusing one that was was trek had a, a few things that were more geared like at the beginning that were more geared towards that kind of role and then everything else i could do after that did all this work and it took was it two and a half years of like really dedicated work to even start getting auditions for it properly mm-hmm. and then once the auditions started coming it took many auditions and a few close calls mm-hmm. and trust me i cried every time i got close and didn't get it oh <laughs> it must have been devastating yeah oh, oh god yeah oh god yeah getting close uh getting something called a hold or an availability check it, and then losing the role is actually more common than people think. Everyone thinks, you know, you audition and then, I don't know, you get a call back and then you get a role, right? Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not that simple. A lot of times you get holds and then they don't materialize. And that's when it's the most brutal. It's one thing to audition and not get it. It's another to audition, be told you're good enough to get it, but we just want to make sure. And then say, you know what? We went with someone else. Oh, so you were like that- this that's like and, gut in the meantime, punching. Yeah. And I yeah. assume in the meantime, you're missing out on potential other work because you're on hold. You're if I'm on like, hold, availability. yeah, because yeah. once I hold a section of dates, I have to make sure that anything I audition for won't conflict with that. It actually hurts. So yeah, yeah like and that happened several times a track, which is, but that was my goal. And I, I stuck to it until I finally got the call. And that yeah. moment, that oh. moment. I mean, how elated were you when you got that call? Was yeah, that, I mean, it must have been my, my agent called me and told me over the phone, and I just started crying. Oh, so, wow. Like, I just broke because it was everything I worked for. Yeah, I was going to say, you had years yeah. of, you know, focus and work and these dreams, and then it comes to that moment. It, it, it was probably physically a release for you. Very much so. That word. Very yeah. much so. I was so. stunned by that TikTok because that was sort of the thing I watched. And like I said earlier, I mean, the biggest thing for me out of it was it's great. It's a great story about the power of resilience and about, and I think a lot of young people out there today is what they're suffering with. I do find, I do work with a lot of people, guys who are in their mid 20s and girls who are in their uh, young mid 20s. Resilience seems to be a lot of issue. And it's a, uh, I think it's a great tale on how if you want something bad enough and you're willing to work hard enough and you take the blows as they come and you enjoy the successes, um, you'll be amazed at what's possible. Yeah, a lot of people just, they expect that once they're like three, four, five years into being an actor, they're going to hit it big. They're, they're going to have their big break. And you know what? Some people do, but that's luck. And not to take away from their hard work, definitely hard work, definitely talent, but there is a lot of luck. And mind you, luck isn't some superstitious you know divine intervention thing this is literally right place right time and once the opportunity is in front of you you have the ability to actually impress enough that then they go yes you're the one that is luck always have to be ready and but most actors a lot of people don't make it in my class my film school class we started with 60 people graduated with something like 13 
Wow. Yeah. Only two of us are working. And wow. I'm the only one in the union. Wow, that's crazy. Oh. And that's just Ooh. more. I can see like that. Dwindle, too. dwindle, dwindle, dwindle. Jeez. Yeah. But see, that makes a sense because I think in the industry, the business of show, we all grow up with this romantic notion of what it is. So even if you're young going into film school, it's still going to be very prevalent in your mind that this is how I become, you know, how I arrive, and this is going to be easy. And, and then, you know, I think a lot of people realise, no, it's a skill set. You need to be trained. Not only do you have to learn a trade, because it is a trade, you're learning all these different skills, then you've got to have creativity onto it. Then you've got to be willing to give up the majority of your existence at that time to focus on it. And I think it's a good way to kind of filter out those who have maybe don't have the commitment that it goes into. I myself went to film school and I'll be honest with you, I was 22 at the time and I went, I don't know if I want to spend 16 hours a day on set, you know, and, and you know, I do it for a living now. I'm a videographer, make corporate stuff and that now, but I think it's good that in a way that you filter it out because it is an industry where, what do they say, 95% of actors are unemployed at any one time. That is true. Well, I mean, I do want to point out that a lot of people who, who stop have to Ooh, the cards they were dealt yeah. they can't right they 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 mm. have to put food on the table and have a roof mm. over their head like mm. there are a few of my classmates who honestly if if things were better i think they would they would be working they have the talent they have the drive so i just want to put that out there it's not it's not just about resilience in terms of sticking it out like if my life had other things happen not like not the way that they did perhaps mm -hmm. i would have stopped too i was able to do my joe job so i'm a realtor outside of this no. um, enough and provide myself with enough uh flexibility that i was able to still audition and then uh even though i had to reject some auditions because i couldn't make it I was still doing enough of them that I was keeping myself in front of the casting directors to build my resume and build my body of work over time. Mm -hmm. um, I won't deny that the pandemic was an interesting turn because uh, that changed the industry in terms of wanting actors to physically show up to do auditions. Now they want self tapes and that yeah. drastically increased the number of auditions I was able to do and therefore increased the number of eyes on my face and my work and allowed my, uh, my career to finally start to take off. Um, Sometimes I do wonder if there was no pandemic, would I be here now? Would I have Trek? Because there were casting directors who weren't looking at me uh, mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic. And, you know, sure, I'm a better actor now, but I was still a very, very confident actor then. Aside from Star Trek, you know, Jason and I are both horror fans. So one of the things we were talking about was uh, we know you were in New York City not too long ago for the New York City Horror Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And you had a short that you produced that won Audience Choice Award. Yes, all, amazing. Can you, can you and congratulations on that? Thank you. Number yes, one. absolutely. Can you just give us a little bit about the short and the experience, not only being in the, that film show, but winning? Fishbowl is a, is is a, is a passion project for my uh, my team, my company. Uh, my company is Psychopomp Dreams Entertainment. We're a brand new production company. However. Uh, the group I have have worked on films prior to that to build up before we actually formed the company. We had done a couple of films prior to, to Psycho Pomp, uh, one of which was a horror called Hunting Darkness. And that also uh, was in the festival circuit and, and uh, won a couple of awards as well. Nice. Um, so good. Yeah, award-winning here. All right. Yeah. My best friend, Katisha Shaw, who's also an actor and filmmaker, uh, and I are the co-owners of our company. And when we formed Psychopomp, we formed it along with our friends, uh, Ryan Andrews, uh, who is an incredible screenwriter and director, and mm. Jessica Watson, who's uh, just uh, just it's just a, uh, one of the best actors I've, I've ever seen. And we needed a passion project that we all we all would could believe in and put everything behind that was not too difficult to create because we didn't have a lot of money and we knew we'd be self-funding but also would hopefully do well 
uh, to establish ourselves. So Ryan had written a, uh, a script, a short film, um, based around or inspired by the story of Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love. The idea there was to to kind of explore the drama and the the addiction aspect of things uh, mm. and their relationship and then have have it have a horror twist to it in the end and that was fishbowl so uh prior to fishbowl i hadn't officially produced anything like i did self-produce if you can even call it that a one minute micro short called the only asian uh you can mm -hmm. actually watch it on my website now Oh, good. Um, it was one of those things like at the beginning of the pandemic, the industry is shut down. So I wanted to stay creative. And one of the casting directors in Toronto, Stephen Mann, decided to kind of keep everyone creative and keep the community together. So he he held a a kind of like a, a digital film festival and said, hey, everyone just submit any uh, a film like three minutes or under. And we're just going to like have some official selections, awards and stuff. So I created a film about myself and a buddy of mine, Timothy, Timothy Ng, uh, playing uh, Animal Crossing on our Nintendo Switches. Uh, and I, I, my character is- Well, me, I've, I'm a big Switch fan. So. <laughs> and uh, uh, all the way. Yeah, my just... character basically is trying to hide from his family and play uh, uh, <laughs> Animal Crossing on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> based on a true story i produced, <laughs> produced that it was like a zoom call thing and i just oh like, edited it together and submitted it it didn't go anywhere but then after that i was like "Ooh, this is fun so i meet myself um uh, my good friend jenny wong and katisha well i wrote uh the only asian so the industry had started back up i was uh, on set of a commercial and it was lunch break and i just came up with this idea based around the fact that a lot of my friends during the pandemic had lost their agents and my Asian mm. friends were having a very hard, actually all of my BIPOC friends are having a hard time finding a new agent. And some of the considerations that BIPOC actors have that uh, non BIPOC actors don't have to have are things like how many other people like you are there on the roster. We all know rosters tend to have many of non BIPOC people in a certain category and then maybe one or two in a certain BIPOC category. So, and then the opportunities for us are less, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of things to consider, a lot of frustration around that. So I wrote this thing called The Only Asian where myself and Ginny are two actors who end up with the same agent. And even though she's female and has long hair and tiny and I'm, you know, a tall, short haired Asian man, we essentially can only have one Asian in the roster. So we have a kind of digital screaming fight <laughs> and that's the film katisha who's white passing she's 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 uh she's a latina but she's white passing so we have her come in at the end i was like stop you two what you look nothing alike and then i put on a wig <laughs> like, oh, no! uh... <laughs> that film went on to get selected at i think something like 40 film festivals wow and nice. something awards and was screened at the chinese theater Oh, in Hollywood. Congrats, so, man, that's awesome. Thank you. But that, yes. that's, by the way, it could not have weird. happened if it's not for the pandemic because I have no editing skills, none. I can't <laughs> even I can't even shoot things properly. I just basically use cell phones. I had oh. everyone shoot their own footage and edit it together and just said, it's a Zoom call. That's why the quality <laughs> sucks. <laughs> smart well, move, smart move. As an editor myself, I, I could have say these days with cap cut and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's that tough for us. coming numbered. Yeah. Um, because the things you can do with mobile technology, even you yeah, know, yeah. you see a lot of the stuff on TikTok now and the ability of people to be creative on there and make content. It's and growing up in this world where yeah. you know, when I was a kid to actually shoot anything, you need a eight millimeter camera, you needed film, you needed a playola, you needed all that kind of stuff these days. You just grab your phone, right? You also had to go uphill both ways, you, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> miles and miles, miles and miles. In American terms. See, I'm not using kilometers. No, that's right. Maybe miles a Canadian being nice to you. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, mate, look, this. I'm Australian. We use we, oh, we understand and embrace okay. yeah. kilometers system. and kilometers. Yeah, yeah. So you know, forget his uh, whole. Uh, <laughs> I have to or, for my measure by bald eagles. <laughs> yeah. well, I... eagles. But yeah, so Katisha was also in the same path as me. So she was making little short films that were doing well as well. Mm -hmm. And we basically said we should try to make like better films. <laughs> so we got people together, and and we did. 
uh, Hunting Darkness showed us what our potential was. So once we had that, like I said, Ryan wrote Fishbowl and Katija and as well as Michael Delaney and Jessica Watson, they star in it. They're the leads. I'm in it as well, but I have a smaller role. Watson and I, um, Watson, Jessica Watson's uh, screen name, uh, stage name, sorry, is uh, Watson Rose. So Watson and I, uh, we co-produced it. Katisha executive produced it. Uh, so it's both Watson and my first credits as producers. And yeah, we made that film on $15,000 and shot it uh, technically one day for the main footage. And then my green screen stuff is on the second day. So two days of filming. Wow. And my son was born on the day we, we, we filmed it. Oh, wow. wow. So, oh, I was, on, that I was halfway through the day. I'm like, I got to go, guys. So you got to <laughs> Before we even got to uh, at 3 a.m. on the day of, uh, my wife told me that she was in labor. So wow. I, you know, like for indie stuff, people have multiple roles, right? So I was mm. line producer, COVID officer, yeah. harassment mm. officer, and a whole yeah, bunch yeah. of other roles. So I couldn't be there. I ended up calling my friend Tamish Tariq, not someone in the industry, works for the government, but he's one of my best friends. And he came through, he basically became a PA. And, and just did whatever people told them to do. And uh, we also got Phil Green, who who also came, uh, same as Tamish, he, he came and helped. And because we, we always say in, in, in Psychopont Dreams, uh, we say we don't fix it in post, we fix it in prep. Because we had mm. planned as much as we did, we were able to roll with the fact that my son was going to be born. And on top of all that, my wife, who I just need to mention Jessica, uh, my wife is incredible because I had a lot of stuff in the back of my car. <laughs> and um, Hamilton, which is where we shot it, is like an hour and something from Toronto. So she actually told me to go. Even though I didn't want to go, she said, no, you got to drop stuff off. You guys are funding this film. It's a lot of money. Get it done. And I didn't want to miss yeah. my son's birth, but she's like, no, just do it. The longer we argue, the more chance you have of missing it. So I drove over to Hamilton, dropped everything off, and came back, and my son was born two hours later. Oh, sweet. You made it on that's, time. Like, safe. That's a beautiful story. And that's it's, amazing, man. Yeah, it's a great story also about how important it is to have a partner, someone with you that supports you on your journey. I've got a wife who oh, yeah. believes in me, you know, and that's Same. so important when you're taking risks in life, to have someone who loves you and believes in you yeah absolutely jessica mm. is my uh she's my reader when i most of the time if she can't do it i have friends who will help me but i i prefer having her mm. because she is just she has backed my career like 110 percent. i yeah. wouldn't be able to have done this if my wife wasn't this supportive of my career That's um, wonderful. Yeah. so she's my reader she actually like she throws herself into it. She's not an actor. Mind you, she's now starting to try to become a, a voice actor herself. Oh, cool. She's just at the beginning of that journey. She fell in love with it by being my reader, actually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she just throws herself into all the different roles she has to read that I have to, of the different characters I have to talk to. It's it's amazing. And oh, I just great. cannot imagine my career being where it is now if I didn't have someone who invested that much into helping me so that I can then you know, react and listen yeah. to the the other characters while I'm I'm doing my auditions on tape. I know you did a ton of theater work too. How was that transition going in from theater to television? It for was Star Trek. Uh, well, Star Trek came later, so so mm -hmm. Star Trek wasn't difficult. Uh, by the time I got there, mm -hmm. uh, I understood how to do that. The initial transition from from theater to film was a, a little harder because theater is so much larger um, mm. in terms of the way you express, the way you emote, because you need everyone to see and everyone to hear, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of projection and all that. And I remember when I was getting into film and, and commercials and all that, they always, like, I would go into an audition, they're like, don't, don't project so much. I'm like, I, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> well, wow. you're just imagine the sound guy going, <laughs> yeah, me, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, I would I would be very big with, with the things I did. And they're like, no, no, bring it down, Michael. Bring it down. Because mm -hmm. film is all about filtering. And I did have training to filter in film school. But because I was doing so much theater, I leaned more into that at first, right? 
So then it was just a matter of, I took a lot of classes and I, I have uh, my own mentor, Vladimir Bondarenko, who was my private coach. And basically I did a lot of work trying to just filter all of that emotion down so that I'm grounded and more uh, uh, just still. Because, mm. you know, obviously when you have a camera in front of you, especially when it's on a close up, even little, little movements is big, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah they're huge. Say. So, yeah, it took a lot of work and it was very hard for wow. me to, 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 to filter to the point where I am at now. And when you obviously when you go that transition from theater to film, you know, you've got rehearsal time in theater and it's all about repetitive getting it. You don't have that big a luxury, do you, when you're on a television or film set? I mean, you know, you know, I know some generally... of the bigger directors will get a couple of weeks rehearsal for their actors, but generally not, right? Yeah, no, I, I don't have a lot of rehearsal time uh for film and television that at least for the roles that i've had sometimes we do get a few <laughs> couple of, of of rehearsals while on the day of you know mm. or if i i'm like on this tv show that i can't really talk about that's coming out mm. sometime this year um my 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 co-stars and i you know we would we would we would run lines in the green room or whatever yeah like unlike theater where you have more time to rehearse a show and Mind you, you then have to perform the whole thing beginning to end. You know, in yeah. television and film, we have less time, but then, you know, each day that you're on set, you just have to do a specific number of scenes over and over again. Yeah. So there's yeah. that. But I suppose it allows you to really focus in some of your delivery on certain, those certain scenes. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. So, and... Yeah, I mean, like when you first got onto TV or, or a film, I mean, I was, I mean, even with Star Trek, even though you said it was later on, I can imagine that whole kind of, I can't believe I'm on a film set. Oh, my God, don't screw this up. Don't screw this up. You know, remember my lines. Keep going from my head. I mean, what a sway of emotions it must be. And then on top of it, you got to perform. Oh, yeah. No, I... Honestly, like my, I remember my first day on, on, on the set of discovery and it literally felt like my first day on set all over again. Yeah. You must've, you know? there must've been that moment where you're going, holy shit, I'm on Star Trek. Even yeah. this is that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my, the first, the first time I ever went to the studio was to get my COVID test. And I remember showing up and I had no idea what the layout of the studio was. Like I, I've never been there. That was the biggest studio I had ever been to in my life. And I, you know, I walked into the office building. I was like, you know, there's a building right there and I'm parked yeah. over here. And I walked in with this big smile, you know, goofy grin on my face. And I'm picking like happy steps. Walk up there. Yeah. I said, hi, I'm Michael Tan. <laughs> I'm here for Star Trek Discovery COVID tests. <laughs> da -da -da. <laughs> there you go, music. Yeah, you, you go to the medical area. <laughs> Whoops. What is this? <laughs> this is the, the production office area. And yeah. Where where do I go? <laughs> like, oh, oh, you're new. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Did you sign in? Sign in. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> greens! Oh <Yeah>. man! <laughs> oh, a whole bunch oh of that's stuff. hilarious! And then, and then it's like the big walk. I'm like, thank you, have a great day. And the guy's like, you okay? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like walking myself to every like. It's probably obvious to everyone is my first time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but why not own it? Enjoy yeah, it. You know? it. What a magical yeah. moment that is. Honestly, I, I I mean I I did quite a few days on on Trek. Um, yeah. That was the first time I had been on any any production as long as I had been, because uh, I'm in two episodes, and mm. there was not a single day that I went to work, whether it was for wardrobe, COVID test, or to to film stuff, that I wasn't just completely. It's just beyond happy. I was elated. I was mm. blown away, Con like consistently blown away. Um, Looking at yourself in the mirror when you've got that Star Trek uniform on in oh, wardrobe, that's be... that combat. I mean, holy crap! What a moment! Yeah, 
Did they let you keep it or no? <laughs> don't I, I don't, <laughs> the only thing I get to keep is my the sticker I get when I get to set. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's, it's Star Trek Discovery, Michael Chan cast. There you oh, go. Yeah, that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have a whole bunch cool. of them actually from every single day. I, I either work there or go there for wardrobe or, or COVID tests. And I have like I have them stuck on the back of a piece of paper. So, <laughs> so yeah. how does it feel to be a meme? A meme. Yeah. yeah, so I'm an animated GIF, and yes, yeah, animated GIF. people yeah. fight yeah. me on this. <laughs> you can't change my mind. It's GIF. It's GIF. Um, it. Who's GIF? <laughs> I had no idea that had happened. Oh, until I was tagged. Well, Lieutenant Commander Ray, who's Rachel. Oh who's yeah, I know Ray. Right? Yeah, yeah. So she she tagged me because uh, at Dex Lower is the oh, account. Yeah, that's how we met. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's how we met. Yeah, they yeah. they used the the good idea, Jeff, uh, from of Admiral Vance going good idea and then turning to me. Yeah, and Ray was like, "Oh, that's Michael Chan." <laughs> and so I saw. I'm like, "Wait, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jeff." Yeah. So then I went on to Twitter, I'm like, <laughs> searching different ways to get different Jeffs to pop up. I'm like, "Oh my god, I can find myself too." <laughs> um, right. It's. It's yeah. not something I had ever thought about. Then when I found out, I was I was shocked and happy and just like, what? <laughs> uh, it makes you, well, you must feel part of the, the, the broader pop culture kind yeah. of zeitgeist with that. If you're part of a meme, that's, you know, in this when, day and when age, the influence a, of that is massive. When you have an unnamed Starfleet officer being a GIF, now you know... <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you've somewhat made it somehow. Um, By the way, it's still weird to me that I don't have an actual name, and I'm in yeah. two episodes. Same yeah, with my F buddy Emmanuel John, who plays the uh, FHQ security officer. We always show up as a pair. Yeah, and um, yeah, well, the two of us keep laughing about this. We're like, why don't we have names? But people who show up for one episode have three lines and then die. Have a name. <laughs> we'll never Is forget. Jeff, <laughs> yeah, we're, never, yeah, we're yeah. alive, so we're yeah. alive. We should, yeah, <laughs> should be happy that you have a chance to come back. Have you given yourself your own names? Have you like? Yeah, oh, there well, you go. If it was me, I call Lieutenant myself Lieutenant John, and I'm I'm Lieutenant Chan. So ah, oh, um, there you go. And Perfect. we actually we have not pitched this to to CBS, but we both want to have our own Star Trek sitcom, like an office sitcom <laughs> called Upper Decks. Um, where, <laughs> yeah, it's about uh, us two being upper decks officers on uh, Federation <laughs> HQ. Uh, Admiral Vance is kind of like, you know, like the, it's kind of like, think of Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but in space, yeah. right? So oh, the two of us it, are yeah. troublemaker officers, and Admiral Vance hates our guts, but we're so good at our job that he can't help but keep having us on the bridge. So, like, the two of us are just... Every time we, we have the chance, we do something stupid. And we created this game called uh, a beam tag. Because, you know, like the, the 30 second century comm badges are like instant transport, personal transporters, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, yeah, it's really whatever. cool. X-Men, who poofs. Oh, Nightcrawler. Oh, Nightcrawler, yeah. 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 So, so we're yeah, like we're, we're last two geeks. Yeah. Around yeah. The station. <laughs> one of us is it. And we have the other one, you know. So oh, beam tag. transporting beam tag. That sounds cool. <laughs> and so we keep getting ourselves in trouble with our beam tags and other horrible things we come up with. And that sounds the great. Fans, yeah, you too again. <laughs> I've watched hey, that. You know, I've Paramount are pretty are pretty open these days with you should pitch it. approaching Trek from different avenues now. So you never know. It's you know, with lower decks and prodigy and all that now. Can I actually talk you talked about Admiral Vance? Getting to work with that legendary actor, what was that like? Oh, uh, oh my God! Oh, yeah. So I, I have loved Oded Fair since I saw him in the Mummy. Like, yes, of course. He is yeah. one of my heroes. So I remember the first time I saw his name on on the on the script, and I was like, "Wait, I get to work with Directly. Oded Fair? What? Oh, man. <laughs> I've seen Oded is a class act." He is one of the kindest, most down-to-earth people I have ever met in this industry. Mm. Um, and such a, a, a good family man. You know, he he's constantly in touch with his family. You know, his Aww. daughter needed him for something. So, you know, he took a call on the, the bridge of the Discovery. <laughs> 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 he, walks, 
He had to go from our like <laughs> room area yeah, he's not a into discovery. It's like I'm just gonna take. I'm going into discovery. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> we come back out afterwards. Um, yeah. Yes, we sat outside of the bridge to wait for our stuff. Anyways, uh, <laughs> Discovery's bridge and the FHQ bridge are in the same. Uh, uh, the curtain is and, revealed. <laughs> and if it's like Andy said, I've been on a, I was actually on the, I talked about Joe, didn't know this. I was actually on the Mortal Kombat set because I filmed it here in mm -hmm. Alabama for that film. Um, and, and you know, it was one of the big, it's the first time I've been on a big Hollywood set. And again, just like television, damn that small area. How do they make it like the lenses they're using to really expand. It's the same thing with Discovery is the bridge actually pretty small it's massive oh it's massive it's exactly the opposite of what i would thought <laughs> no, no discovery's bridge fhq but everything's huge oh yeah okay it's massive it looks huge on camera but you know sometimes and it is huge using and trust me when it's it's multi there are multiple levels to the sets so yeah huh. Yeah, it's yeah, that's it's crazy. Very big. It's not as so like when you watch me jog. Yeah, in, yeah, in that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the yeah. final episode of season. That was four, a workout. Yeah. I wasn't just like one time. It's like again. Oh, oh, this trip I did think faster. that. I'm thinking how many Lower. times did you do that? I did. I lost count. So um, is, is that the secret to the weight loss? Is doing that scene over and over. It's like a pretty big run that looks <laughs> pretty small on camera. Surprisingly. Yeah. Um, and you got it. Hey, man. Steady cam operator with his whole rig running behind me. They're heavy, I mean, man. They're like, really. If you think I had it hard, that guy had it hard. Oh, he's going to run with it. Yeah. Let's run 70, with 80, it. 90 pounds, some of those rigs. Ooh, it's, I, I, I am just blown away by crew, by yeah. the way. The, the amount of stuff they do. And yeah, respect. Yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah, like, um, yeah, no, um, sets are huge, and Oded is amazing. And I also want to mention that Sonequa Martin Green is also, uh, ah, uh, yeah, Michael so Burnham. Funny. My first day, she came up to uh, Emmanuel and I oh. and actually said, Welcome to the Star Trek family. She oh, knew we were wow. the new ones because it was both our first days, and she, she knew that, like. There was nobody else there that day that uh, like with us that was new, just the two of us, that's and she beautiful. came just to welcome us. Wow, that's incredible! That's incredible. And unexpected, and yeah. she's probably got a lot on her plate. She's carrying literally; she's the lead. She's number one on the call yeah. sheet. I would yeah. assume. So yeah. that's that just goes to show, you know, she's a real professional and someone who deserves to be in her position. If, she does things like that. It's the little things, isn't it? Just being recognized from the crowd. But that's not the only show you've been on. Can I talk about Kids in the Hole? You've uh -oh. been on Kids in the Hole. Yes. What was that like? <laughs> that's got to be a bit mad. I did cat, not expect it? to be asked about that. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I've got to bring it up. Kids in the Hole are legendary. Yeah, deep cuts. <laughs> so, so do you, did you, did, you looked at my resume. You know what I, 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 I am on there. Have you watched it? I haven't seen it, but I know the role. I've obviously looked at the role, and I'm, yeah, great. A uh, gay naked man, I believe. And I, it's got a little bit more, but I didn't read past it, to be honest um, with you. But I'm just so, like, oh, so, with kids so, yes, I, 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 I am 100% nude. Aww. Uh, in full On full display for the world. <laughs> Oh, no blurring out, or you were completely. Oh, there's naked. no blurring. There's, there's, there's no blurring. So, oh, wow. So, see, we could. Uh, a naked Starfleet officer. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Go to Amazon Prime, look up Kids in the Hall, episode uh, two of the latest season, and uh, behold. Um, <laughs> so the idea of this interview was to get to know you, so I'm glad I didn't see that before because then I'll probably get to know more. <laughs> now you're going to know me a lot more after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got real close. Uh, so for all the hackers out there in the future, if I ever become a celebrity, you want to go hack my phone for nudes? I'm sorry. It's You're not going to get anything because all the nudity is already on Amazon Prime. It's already Jeff on screen, Bezos yeah. owns my naked body. Uh, What's no, the Hardy was, Boys was, set like? That was, uh, so, so, okay. I, I, will, I will put this out there. So by okay. the time I filmed that, I had gained some weight back. And it's not because I stopped working out on purpose per se but i had lost my mother and my wife and i had to terminate a pregnancy oh, um, all within a span of three months so Ooh. 
Sorry. By that point, I had basically given up. I mm. was in a very bad place. I had told my agents that I wanted a hiatus, of which they tried to give me, but I also put it out there that if there were any good roles that they felt that I absolutely had to audition for, they would send it to me, and I will do everything in my power to muster up any kind of energy to do it. Kids in the Hall, uh, I auditioned for several different roles, um, one of which was not the naked man role. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the casting director knows what I'm capable of. Mm. I would hope that she had at that time known what was going on in my life. But, you know, like, I, I, I'm I, still proud of the tapes I sent for Kids in the Hall. Mm -hmm. mm. Because by at the end of the day, they thought of me for the role that I ended up getting. Mm. Um, they thought I was funny enough and game enough to actually be naked. Um, <laughs> it's a compliment which, though, isn't it? From a casting yeah, director? That's got to yes. be a compliment. Um, so in that episode, there are two gay characters. Uh, sorry, not two gay, two naked characters. Uh, myself and the other one is played by Nathaniel Bacon, who is a gorgeous, gorgeous man. Um, he is literally it, built like a, a freaking god. Like his yeah. whole, he's just gorgeous. Blessed with good genetics. Mm. Oh my god, and and a good workout regimen. So, um, helps. He he. So between at that point, I had a dad bod, and he had like the muscly. He, oh, he's he the one from Marvel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, bod, Marvel but, bod. Yeah. By the way, good on the show for going with body diversity and body positivity. So, uh, I, I, but yeah, like I had gained weight and I was not in a good place, but I thought about it because when I was asked if I was willing to do this, that was a hard choice to make because I had, I, I had lost all of the health and fitness gains I, I made over the years to get ready for Star Trek and, and beyond, right? Like I had every intention of maintaining uh, the, 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 the fitness and the weight and all that, that I was at um, forever, if I could, but you know, life, life hits you life uh, circumstances change and priorities change and state of mind changes. Like I'm not fully, it's been like a year and a half and I am still not fully recovered from, from, from everything that uh, that year had thrown at me, but I, I did think about it. I'm like, am I ashamed of my new body, the new shape that I am? And, you know, there is a part of me, even now that is, you know, a little down on myself because I feel like I've let go. But at the end of the day, that is me. And that is the me that they wanted to put on screen. So really, what did I have to lose? If that is what they want, they want to see exactly because mm -hmm. your own so demons I, are going to mess with you in regards to that. So I said, so, "Yeah, you know what? Now's a good time. You know what? I'm going to get back out there. I'm going to do this role. You know, mm -hmm. I've been down for for uh, a few months. I need to pick myself back up. So I put myself in the most vulnerable position on camera I could possibly put myself in, fully naked." How did you feel after shooting that? I mean, was it invigorating? Did you feel some sort of... There's got to be an adrenaline rush, I'm assuming. There's got to be something around it. It was... It was... It's hard to describe how I felt. Um, I was proud of myself. Yeah, you should be. Yeah, absolutely. But absolutely, remember, yes. I was still not... That was It was the deaths and, and the termination. The death and the termination were very fresh at the time. Yeah. So it wasn't all there. Um, yeah, so really, so compared it, to it, the other things going on in life, this really didn't factor yeah. in. My memory of that time would be clearer, mm -hmm. and I would have felt more had I been in a better place. But now, you know, further away from it, now that I'm looking back, I'm very proud of it. And it's I'm great on your resume. You work for kids in the hole. I mean, that's a good thing when you're talking about career it's, building. They don't, it's, you know, it's they a legacy show yeah. with the original cast yeah. who I got to work with. 
Oh, that's and incredible. That's incredible. It was a really good experience on set. And just, I did not know how much I needed the time I was on set there because yeah. it took my, my, my mind away from everything that was happening. Yeah. That's great. My wife, favorite show. One of the, because, you know, if you go to my wife, Netflix, it looks like nothing but crime and death and investigations and all that. I'm sure, that's she not my loves. Netflix. <laughs> yeah, my Netflix is full of like fantasy stuff. And stuff. <laughs> Mine is like true you go crime. To my wife, and it's just, just like this dark insight to the human condition. Um, but she loves air crash investigations. So for my wife, she goes, I, and I said I was interviewing you this morning and i said yeah he's been on air crash it's going oh my god that's amazing can you <laughs> ask him about it so <laughs> i've got to ask you you were you on a couple of episodes as a hong kong investigator on air crash investigations what was the uh what was the real story you were doing well because they're all based on fact real air crash so here's the funny part. In, in both of the episodes I'm in, in uh, season 19 and season 20, yep. the accident that uh, my characters were in resulted in no actual massive loss of life. Oh, oh that's, that's good. Right, Which yeah. is, I'm like, oh, wow. So I'm like one of those better luck characters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, like... So, so outside of Star Trek, I did have a mini goal, which only formed uh, with my previous agent because I had auditioned for years and years and years for Mayday, or, or which is what it's called here in Canada. Uh, uh, so I had auditioned so much for it that I remember telling my, my previous agent, you know, they keep asking me back. Why don't we see if we can actually get me on there? <laughs> so I remember, like, the first time I got on that show, honestly, the biggest role I ever had at that point in my career. Because that's and, 2018, uh, is it? 2019? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, just, I just know it's season 19. And I played the uh, Hong Kong investigator for a malfunction in an airplane with the engine. Gotcha. Um, and that was also where I, I met one of my voice acting mentors, uh, Marilla Wex. She's an amazing actor, one of the best voice actors. If you like Minecraft, go look up the list videos that Mojang puts out for Minecraft. Okay, She's the yeah. British female voice in that. Oh, cool. Uh, cool. Yeah, Marilla, that's where I met her. And uh, she played the, the British investigator. Uh, in that episode so they liked me and the work i did uh the first time around so that when i auditioned again for season 20 they were like hey weren't you weren't you in the last season I'm like yeah 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 i was like what'd you play i'm like i was an investigator so like, cool cool okay just making sure and then so they cast me as the uh security person who inadvertently let a athlete famous athlete through uh security even though they had uh, bottles of gasoline that they claimed were bleach in their oh. duffel bag, which then wow. leaked, uh, caused, and then there was a, a, a motorcycle battery next to his bag, so it kind of touched and caused an explosion, killed the guy's brother, oh, but killed shoot. nobody else, and then they landed the plane. Wow, wow. Joe, yeah. take it away because I could just spend hours, talking yeah, about yeah, it. yeah, yeah, all these TV roles. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I've got one last Trek related question. There's been a, a lot of chatter in the uh, Trek verse about a possible horror Trek based Trek show, especially with the success of what happened to poor Hammer on Strange New Worlds. Yeah, I'm um, still getting over that. <laughs> so, you know, we know that you are the co host of the Hellbound Horror Podcast. Mm. And we were wondering, without getting into any trouble, yes, it is here. Yes, we would Ooh. love for you to speak about that. As well, but you've done a few episodes 62, 62, 62. episodes. So make sure you go and check them out. Season the two is uh coming out on February because we're on a small hiatus right now. We just needed a break. Uh, <laughs> February 1st will be our first season two episode. There we, we go. just actually recorded it this morning. So, would you be particularly auditioning for this horror centric if they do come out with this? If, you, if, you, is that all for you? <laughs> I've heard the rumors. So I okay. I would love honestly, I would love for Star Trek to have 
such an expanded universe that they have shows of every and they're already doing that right different types mm. of shows and different genres horror would be such a perfect fit for star trek because they've always had amazing horror episodes you right. know like the Gorn episode in in in, in, in strange new worlds being one of the mm. most recent ones that really evoked the whole alien feel right oh yeah certainly it's right fine. like yeah. that was such a good episode i would love for a for there to be a horror uh trek and b if it's filmed in toronto yes i will absolutely audition for it now if it's not filmed in toronto like picard isn't filmed in toronto so i never got the audition for that but yeah. if they decide that they want to audition outside of wherever they're filming i would be game and i would be happy to to you know be flown over to do it mind you there are difficulties for a canadian uh, to film in the states, there's there's a whole process to that, but I would be happy to start the process just for American Trek. Are you up and to date if, with all the current Trek? Are you watching? I think every Strange Trek? New Worlds is the only one I'm not up to date with, but I'm almost oh. done. Wow, yeah. okay. um, but which is which is sad for me because I have so many friends on there that I was oh. like, guys, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and behind, but no, I've <laughs> I've seen most of them now, like Rachel Selen, Ian Rayburn, Ian Ho. Uh, mm. Joseph Daly. I, I've seen most of them. There's, I think, there's yeah. two more episodes I need to do, and then mm. I'll be done. And I think I have it's, a couple more friends in there. 2022, I think, uh, one of the best years for sure. Star Trek that's ever existed. I agree. Just because of the quality of content we got, we are a little bit critical. We had some issues with Picard season two, but essentially, <laughs> even, even with that. You look at Prodigy, which was so good. I mean, this is a show targeted kids, and it's some of the best Star Trek writing I've it's you know, incredible. Ever seen. It's, a, it's a great first season. I have a problem with I think the second last episode of Prodigy. Yep. Uh, that kind of makes it not as good as season one of uh of Lower Decks, but I, I, yep. I don't know. They're close. They're close. Both yeah. both Lower Decks season one and Prodigy season one are are, are pretty close. Yeah. So, well, I mean, that's a great 2022 when you look at mm -hmm. you know, Picard. Well, first couple of episodes are okay. Um, <laughs> and then we get into but, but a year of having four Star Trek shows in one year um, and to see the quality, you know, to me, at really high level. It's, it's an exciting time to be part of the Star Trek universe. Oh, yeah. and knowing that and you're CBS you know, better jump on that Section 31 show with Michelle Yeoh. Yes, hey, she's going to be very expensive. <laughs> Come on, no, but I'm sure, yes, you get privileged to read these scripts, but you also have this rather large NDA document that forbids you from talking about it too. So that oh, must be absolutely. frustrating because you want to grab your friends and go, you are not going to believe what happens. Right, yeah. But you got to... Yeah. Hey, you know, I, I was part of the Live Long and Podcast, uh, and it still am, Discovery Reaction um, mm -hmm. podcast. So, like, after we watched the episode and immediately react after. Yeah. It was so much fun reviewing season four because yeah. I had told nobody I was in it. Oh. <laughs> You're kidding. So they're watching. So they're it. Knew, they were like, wait a minute. I knew the story. I, they're like, what? And I knew wait everything a minute. from the beginning. And it was it was hilarious because you know i would with my superior acting skills i i <laughs> pretended to know nothing and, <laughs> uh and did they pick it up immediately did Pardon? they pick up immediately cuz that opening shot with you and if, uh, please tell me if i'm wrong the admiral comes up to ask you a question but you got a view screen in front of you i do have view so this is There's funny logo so in front of you. the episode 8 uh i continued to pretend that i'm not there in, mm. in, in the show and i waited for either of my co-hosts to say something especially you know one of my co-hosts is the producer dave mater he's he's the producer of live long podcast so and he's like a massive trekkie so i would have thought he would pick up on that detail so we get to the end of the the review episode and i'm still playing along and he goes okay today i'm introducing a new segment called dave's discoveries and i'm like oh here it comes and no, he doesn't say <laughs> anything. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, he must be joshing me. So I'm going to throw something out there. I'm like, hey, hey, Dave, did you look at the credits? And then my wife is in the comments, right? The live comments typing, yeah. hey, Dave, did you look at the credits? And so he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, look at the credits, dude. So he he actually like brings the credits up on, on because we're live on YouTube. Yeah. And he's like, uh-huh, 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 because you have the main cast. 
And he's like, yeah, this is normal. Like, just keep going, man. And then the first block, like, you know, when it gets to the block of cast, I'm like, literally, like, I think the second one. It's like, oh, Michael Chan. I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, wait, you're not trolling me. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, Dude, are you serious? And so, yeah, he had, he had completely missed it. Wow. And I, I'm not mad. Like, I think that's <laughs> hilarious that we're yeah. so drawn in that he didn't even think that I would. Only thing I did was throughout the entire season, every episode of the podcast I was on, I wore yellow. Oh. <laughs> I was yep. always in yellow something. Yeah. And, um, oh, that's a clever. Which I eventually revealed. I'm like, so that was my hint. The entire time, th every single week that I was on your show, I wore yellow. That was the only hint I ever gave you. I'd be Jeez. beating myself up if I was that producer. I'd be like, it's so obvious. Yeah. He literally told us what he was doing. Yeah. He didn't listen. Oh, my <laughs> God. And then, of course, I didn't tell them I was in the final episode. <laughs> That was <laughs> <laughs> all the yeah, running straight off the bat. You're there, aren't you? Yeah. You're, you know. Although least. then he's like, "Oh, so all of your 9.0 ratings for every single episode." I'm like, "Hey, man, my overload is really <laughs> oh, pissed at me." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Can I, I? I think NDA is going to stop you from saying this, but does your character continue on? Do you know, or are you allowed to say? Not allowed to say. I can't say anything about the future of my character. Okay. Gotcha. Done. That's, That's enough that we need. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But exciting times. You're busy. You've got a busy 2023 ahead of you. I would hope so. <laughs> yes. no, well, that's good um, to hear. I mean, I was already in the studio today. And, yeah. Uh, I will mm. say that although I'm ND8, I'm allowed to say that I am uh, one of the leads in a upcoming TV show. Uh, on YTV, which is right. uh, the the family channel okay. here in Canada. Um, That's I don't know when the show's coming out, but hopefully we'll have an announcement sometime soon. If that show does well, I guess we'll get a second season. There you go. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last year, there was a series that came out on Out TV, which you can watch on Amazon Prime if you subscribe to the Out TV channel, called mm -hmm. Ezra, which is a queer... A vampire action slash romance uh, show. It's very easy to watch. It's just 12 minute episodes, 12 to 15 minute episodes for now, because that was the budget that they had. Season one did really well. They are right. currently nominated for multiple Canadian Screen Awards. So oh, we, we are Congrats. amazing. I play the father of one of the leads. So we are definitely, I know the showrunners want a season two made up of 30 minute episodes, and I know they're trying to get funding for that. So hopefully, you know, if things go well, you'll I'll be filming season two of Ezra with with the rest of the team, and then season two of my upcoming TV show. That's kind of what I'm hoping for. Oh, that's that sounds exciting. Well, we do we do several Star Trek shows, but one of we do here is called the Agony Booth. I don't know mm -hmm. if you happen to see where we we have a wheel where we have all the worst what we consider some of the worst Star Trek shows. We spin that oh. wheel. And then we go watch the episode and we talk about it. Um, you know, and not just a negative, like, oh, we don't like this, but we try to find redeeming features. We look back at it and all that. So at some stage throughout the year, if you have the time, if we haven't annoyed you too much tonight, we'd <laughs> love to have you on one of those shows. I would um, I would love to, to come back. One of the things I wanted to do out of the interview was to kind of demystify a little bit of the process for people who are thinking about getting into acting and things like that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, maybe... And you did this, but you know, express that you know it's a journey. It's a journey. It is a journey, and it's um, it's filled with highs and lows and left and right oh, turns. Absolutely. But it's worth it, you know. Yeah. And uh, you definitely did that for us tonight. So we really absolutely. appreciate that you took the time for us. This has been an exciting dive into the life and the career of you, Michael Chen. Thank you so much for joining us here in the Captain's Quadrant. Uh, let's just. Be sure to let people know where they can contact you and yes. what's the best way to do that. You said your next season of your podcast is coming up. So just tell us again where they can subscribe if you're like stuck with Spotify only or, you know, just explain yeah, all yeah. those wonderful um, things. If you want to follow my career or uh, check out my dad jokes or whatever, like I am, uh, I have the same handle on um, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok, which is at Michael C.W. Chan. 
Uh, I also have a website, uh, michaelchan.ca. Uh, that's and, right. I'm uh, trying to I, secretly bring that up right now. <laughs> I, have, um, I have all my social media linked through there as well, as well as my podcast, which is called The Hellbound Podcast that I co-host with Alexander Blackburn from the UK. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at The Hellbound Podcast. Uh, that's a good picture. on all major uh, podcast platforms, including Spotify and uh, Podbean and Apple Podcasts and Google. Po- Does Google still have a podcast? Yeah, app? they still have a podcast. We're still on that. Yeah, we we're were on, on that. We then we are definitely still on that. We, we tried right, to perfect. put ourselves everywhere. Um, so yeah, at the Hellbound Podcast. You, also on my website, you can I have like a section where you can just find it as well and listen to it. Um, so yeah, that that's yeah. where you can find there it. There it is. Uh, Right. And uh, if you go to Internet Movie Database, I am Michael Chan, and I am the eleventh Michael Chan. I am the Internet Movie Database. I am Michael Chan, number eleven. Uh, <laughs> but I would, I would argue the best, Michael. Chan. That's right. Yes, we would agree. We would agree. We would agree. Absolutely. 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 After talking to you tonight, Love thanks you. again, Michael. That's you, uh, you made these little podcasts very happy tonight to be able to get to somebody who uh, to talk to somebody who's actually. Done it. He's actually yeah. been on set. And there's a good Canadian kid as well. So <laughs> and we look forward as to a all your member of the Commonwealth, I salute you, sir. <laughs> you. All right. And we look forward to all your fun dad jokes on TikTok. Those are oh yeah. I, I, I got a kick come. out of those. Way more to come. <laughs> Awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome. I love how you do it deadpan too. There's never it's just total deadpan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how that how that came to be but (laughs) it works all right thank you so that's going to wrap it up for this episode be sure to join us this thursday for the next episode of the agony booth so until next time thank you again michael live long and prosper